tonight we have the real Operation High Jump. Gunner, I hope you are there, buddy. Welcome aboard. I'm here, Outlaws. How you doing? Doing good, man. Trying to stay warm. I hope you are, too. Um, oh, it's warm. It's like 40 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> <laughs> That's cold here. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, we're making it. Uh, we're doing well and uh, ready to tackle this again tonight. Uh, you put together a lot of good info. We've got the videos queued up and tested tonight, so I think we're ready to go with everything. Uh, so, sir, I will hand it over to you, and we'll get on with it. All right. You know, let, you know last week uh, we used uh, legitimate sources to prove that uh, high jump had nothing to do with secret Nazi bases or attacks by UFOs. And tonight we're going to use legitimate sources to reveal Operation High Jump as it really was. And, uh, you know, I heard people say all the time that history is boring and studying it is, uh, tedious and a waste of time. But I don't really think so. And I, I think that the history of Operation High Jump is just as interesting as the fake ones. <laughs> and if I present it well tonight, whistlers, uh, won't find it, uh, boring at all, really. So what I did was, uh, this topic has a lot of minutia, you know, logs, reports. I'm not going to give you all that. I broke it down into a few categories that I thought were the most uh, important and informative, and uh, so here we go. Um, high jump, the mission of high jump, was it was primarily primarily a military operation, um, but it definitely had uh, scientific aspects, and you know it was classified as an Antarctic expedition, and it was one of a series of these operations that was designed to train. Uh, the U.S. Navy and polar oper operations. Um, and this polar training was regarded as a strategic important uh, imperative uh, by military planners because they they thought the Soviet Union was a real threat and they thought we might have a war in it in the Antarctic or or in the Arctic you know, or in Alaska, you know, whatever. And uh, the information was declassified at the time simply because U.S. military planners wanted to. Uh, try to establish some kind of defensive outpost at the at the South Pole, and um, there were concerns, uh, you know, that Soviet bombers could fly over both poles. And um, one of the motivating factors for it um, was also to claim some sort of sovereignty uh, over a portion of Antarctica. The military denied this, though, but 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 it was there. Um, but uh, in, in the post-war period. There were a lot of other countries that had tried to lay, lay claims to portions of the Antarctic. And so basically the, the military objectives were to train personnel, test equipment in frigid conditions. Um, they wanted to consolidate uh, and, and extend U.S. sovereignty over a, the largest practical area possible. And uh, But they denied that. They wanted to determine if it was feasible to establish and, and maintain uh, some kind of uh, base down there, and they they were investigating possible sites. Well, they already had two or three, and and they were actually going back um, to the to those sites. Um, they wanted to develop t techniques for establishing uh, air bases on the ice, you know, down there. That was major priority, and that's why they put Bird in charge. Um, ah, right. Yeah. And they want, yeah, and they wanted to amplify. Um, for the scientific portion, you know, they wanted to get more knowledge of uh, hydrographic and geographic and geological, meteorological, and electromagnetic stuff down in there in in the area. And so, you know, it wasn't it wasn't just a a mission to go down there and uh, and fight Nazis. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this uh, um, the publicity at the time, uh, you know, is. It was widely publicized uh, even before they went. You know, even before November 1946, um, in an article that was reprinted in prominent newspapers like the New York Times and the Montreal Daily Star, um, the commander, uh, Admiral Cruzen, no noted that High Jump showed that the Navy was capable of providing waterborne supplies to troops and operating under the most stringent polar conditions, and it was not secret. There were 11 journalists aboard the high jump ships, and among them was the d distinguished war correspondent Lee Vanetta, who I've mentioned before, and who was not, as previously claimed, uh, a Chilean reporter. 
he's actually a U.S. war correspondent. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and the science and the and the science writer for the New York Times, Walter Sullivan, was among those eleven reporters that were down there to cover this operation. Uh, and between uh, December 1946 and mid March 1947, these eleven journalists transmitted over 2,000 messages back to Washington, totaling four, 400, almost 500,000 words um, for transmission to their employers. And, and some of the people actually uh, wrote books about their own experiences afterward. Uh, there were several camera crews, uh, Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Army, and civilian news reporters who documented everything. And uh, so it's kind of misleading to state, you know, given the degree of the press coverage down there, uh, that little information was released to the media about the mission. Hmm. But most journalists were sus suspicious of it because there was just a huge amount of military hardware involved, you know. So yeah. they were really suspicious of it. Um, but the expedition itself was a big deal, and the country was really excited about it, and especially since it was peacetime. You know, you know, it was a peacetime mission. It was it was an Antarctic exploration, and so it got a lot of publicity. There was even a campaign uh, beginning in November '46 with a press release for people to send uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes to Antarctica, and then have them returned in reply, uh, complete with the operation's what they called uh, cancellation postmarks. And these uh, and these return postcards, or what they called covers. Um, were like collector's items. And during my research, you know, I, I kept noticing this mention of, of lots of mail. And I, and I was wondering, how did all this mail get down there? And how did all these postcard uh, covers uh, get sent back? I mean, so I looked into it, and it, this is the most interesting thing that I discovered about this operation, and I had to include it. And it because it started with a Navy press release on 19 November forty six that gave the public instructions, you know, on, on how these, how to send these letters down there so that they could get stamped by the Navy. And they gave them a deadline of December 1st. Um, as a result of the publicity, uh, there were 42 mailbags of, of these uh, requests that were delivered to the USS Mount Olympus uh, prior to their leaving uh, Norfolk, Virginia on December 2nd. And uh, these requests were submitted from addresses in 125 different countries, including uh, Borneo, Saudi Arabia, El Salvador, and they and they got this uh, this uh, Navy commander uh, assisted by a, a a postal clerk, second class, at, and they and they put this commander Vogley in charge of this. And uh, huh. Vog, Vogley says that uh, when they when they started. Uh, down there, and when they left Norfolk and started having uh, heading south, um, they were going through the ice pack in the Ross Sea on December 30th, 46, and he he felt that uh, they were going to be at uh, the base down there at Little America by January 5th. So he postmarked all of the stuff uh, on January 10th, and um, but the. <laughs> But they were still fighting their way through the pack ice off the Ross Sea with these other ships in the, in the central group. So they didn't even reach Little America until a week later. And, um, but this was just a huge volume of, of all this, uh, and the actual application of these postmarks, you know, these sailors stamping these things, uh, um, wow. was like, uh, it's something else because that, that the Navy would provide that service. Uh, to the public, you know, even these stamp collectors that recognized uh, the Navy recognized the importance of it. And uh, so, public uh, I got a question about this, Gunner. So you're saying, what yeah. if I understand this correctly? So people, just General Joe Schmoes, I hear, sent it in a postcard, and they took it down there, and then they stamped it as like it had arrived in a post office, and then they shipped it right. back here just to have it as a collector's item, right? Yes. Yeah. And so they, so one yeah. thing I found interesting about this is you say here that they, this, this ship left out of Norfolk and it was projected to be there on the, it left in the 30th and then left, and then supposed to be down there at the 5th or when did it actually leave? Yeah. That, seemed, that seemed like a really fast turnaround. Yeah. It wow. left on December 2nd. Oh, okay. And, okay. uh, 
so so they were so they were you know it it takes uh, what uh, two weeks <clears throat> two weeks to get down there. Okay. That makes much more sense. You know, I was like, looking at that as they yeah. left on the thirtieth, and I'm like, five days. I just can't, I can't imagine that. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> no, I, no, it takes them two weeks. I, I okay. think I think the date was uh, uh, they left on December second, and uh, um, they were down they were down there getting trying to get through the ice pack on on uh, December thirtieth. They even it, it shows them even spending Christmas uh, <laughs> trying to fight through this ice pack down there. So yeah, it take them two to three weeks just to get down there, oh. but you know they made every effort to to painstak painstakingly uh, stamp these seals to these envelopes and answer hundreds of letters uh, containing requests for autographs, or uh, people just wanted to know information about it. Hmm. And and there are, there are actually collectors that, that have these uh, postcards actually signed by Admiral Byrd himself. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and right. I have. Yeah, and and I have one of those, uh, and and the source is uh, just an example of one of those. And and um, when the mail was transferred uh, um, to the U.S. Coast Guard ship Northwind uh, in the Bay of Wales, which is down there, um, just off the Ross Sea, that it got transported to the carrier, and and then because I was wondering how how did this stuff get back? I mean, they had all this mail down there, and they're trying to do this. Well, how does it get back? So. Just to explain it, you know, that they would use the, 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 uh, the cutter, the, the ice cutter, one of the ice cutters, and they, they'd get it to the aircraft carrier. And, uh, when the aircraft carrier went back, uh, like I say, it was one of, the, it was the first one to start going back. And so what they did was it, they dropped all the mail off when they went through the Panama Canal zone. And, and, uh, they did this on February 18th. And so that was when, the, the mail started getting back to the United States, hmm. and uh, but but the, the this press release to the public was was, do, was done with uh, such short notice um, that uh, somebody uh, from uh, Washington <laughs> radioed this commander that was in charge of this mail thing and advised him that there was there was and this was on December seventeenth that there was such a heavy volume of mail. That it that it continued to accumulate in New York, and then it would be sent south when the, when the aircraft carrier uh, departed in early January. <laughs> and just just imagine this sort of public participation. You know, they had the there must have been hundreds of school projects with, with with thousands of American school kids. You know, mailed these envelopes. You know, waiting for a response from this. You know. Oh yeah, right. I mean, that would have been a big deal. You know, this was pre. You know, most people didn't have a television. <laughs> <laughs> this was oh, yeah. this was back when people actually read stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, you know. So, so in order to get prepared for this deluge of mail coming, this commander uh, requisitioned an additional half dozen of these uh, high jump rubber stamps and and an equal number of these Mount Olympus uh, postmarks. You know, because they were they were they were the post office. You know, and these were these were carried south by the aircraft carrier in January along with all this mail. And uh, they transferred it to another ship, and it finally delivered it to the Mount Olympus on January 30th. And um, there's been some estimation of these uh, of all this mail coming down coming down there and getting back. And the most reliable estimates uh, total from approximately 150,000 upwards to 650,000 of these covers uh, that were stamped and sent back. Uh, and that's according to the New York Times. Wow. Well, you know, the one that you, you've got a you've got this picture of this on your documentation here. The one thing that I find yeah. the most interesting about it is the depiction for all the, the people who refuse to 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 take in your facts and to like the conspiracy piece, but they do depict the ice wall on this. I mean that that's like uh it's kind of over a cartoonish, but I, I'm yeah. kinda getting the glimpse <laughs> of that that is the ice wall, right? And they they're saying it's like really big and the ship's really small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an exaggeration, but it, yeah. but it it it, uh, it you know, it, it, and it's got the the navy guy who's supposed to be a a, a seal, you know, yeah, a, or a seal with a navy a navy hat on, and he, and the anchor is is scraping on the top of this ice shelf, <laughs> and you got this tiny little ship below. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. It, yeah, the uh, the official report of, of the operation was, was published. Uh, Later on, about three months after 
um, they got back in uh, 1947 in, in July, and they were, it was so big they had to publish three volumes of it, and um, and it covered everything from aviation, ship operations, communications, navigation, cargo handling, rations, personnel, you know, all this day-to-day minutia of this thing. And I've, I've looked at it, and that's where... <laughs> And that's where it gets really boring and, and stuff like you get bogged down in that for, for days. But, yeah. um, but you know, perhaps because it, it had this initial classification of, of confidential, right? And it wasn't available to the general public. And so a lot of people thought that the U.S. government, uh, later had mm-hmm. something to hide. But, uh, but if you look, if you look at the document itself, um, it's not, it's not really like that. Yeah, confidential really isn't that high of a classification, right? I mean, that, that's that's no, pretty it is low. the lowest. Yeah. I mean, you, you receive that classification. Um, I mean, immediately after graduating boot camp. I mean, it, it just means that uh, if you come, you're not supposed to say anything about uh, or violate operational uh, security. Basically, right. if you see a document on a, on a, on somebody's table, you, you know. You're literally supposed to turn it over, <laughs> stuff like that. You right? Know? Yeah. Don't tell anybody, you know, what the Marine Corps or, or the Navy's doing, and just you know, yeah. keep your mouth shut and do your job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think the public may have been unaware unaware that it was unclassified in '55, and uh, because anybody that wanted to obtain a copy of it would have had to uh, request it from the Navy Department, you know, and the Freedom of Information Act wasn't established until 1974. You know, yeah. Well, so it would have been hard. For, uh, it would have been available, but I just th- think that most people, the average person, wouldn't have known uh, how to get a hold of it. Yeah, when I you think, know, was, I think until the the revolution in the '60s, I think most people trusted the government. They didn't. They wouldn't even been interested in seeing this document, probably. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, you know, you had all this publicity and, and all this public involvement, and I don't think there was any issue with the public whatsoever right. about something squirrely happening down there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think there was any question at all that that you know that what what happened happened. You know, it was never classified uh, secret or top secret or anything like that. And and if you compare this uh, the Navy official report with uh, Admiral Byrd's uh, 1947 uh, article uh, called uh, Our Navy Explores Antarctica, published in National Geographic magazine um, in October 47, after uh, after they came back. Um, there's nothing in in his article <laughs> that that's any different from the from the official report. In fact, there's probably more information in there than the official report contained. Mm. So, you know, there's no evidence for suppression of information anywhere. Um, And, uh, you know, the the, the peer-reviewed study that I I have cited concluded that there was no evidence for any concealment. And there was nowhere in any of the articles that were published uh, of any uh, consideration of of any threat from uh, Germans or the Third Reich or... I mean, the only threat that was mentioned was from the Soviet Union, right. and uh, and I when I went through the document, I went the whole 540 pages. You know, I did a search and I, I did a word search, and it, the word German, Nazi, and UFO don't appear anywhere <laughs> in the in the 550 page report. You know, so and the U.S. Navy, what, uh, when they, when they did their flying missions down there, their mapping missions, um, they didn't fly over any of the territory that was originally mapped by the Germans in, in 38 and 39. And this was because the ships of the Eastern and Western Task Forces, would, for one thing, they were short of time, uh, and they could only take like a, a cursory uh, survey of that area. It was called Droning Maudland, and it was at the far end of their operational range, you know, so it was just not important to them or anything like that. Right. Um, and it, the preparations for the mi- the mission were made in a hurry. I, I think it I, I think it uh, was it started in uh, June or July, you know, bef- before the ships began to leave uh, in December, early December. And um, and it was also due to the, they had delays because some of the heavy equipment that they had ordered uh, was coming back 
uh, delivered late from manufacturers. And, um, mm. of course, uh, all the combat aircraft had already been flown off the uh, carrier and replaced by these uh, 6R4D uh, airplanes, which were loaded on there by crane. And uh, the two seaplane tenders that went, like I said, they loaded these three Mariner flying boats on each of them. Hmm. And they were carrying thousands of gallons of aviation fuel and spare parts. And uh, these uh, th- these two tenders were modified uh, prior to the operation, including removing their, their weaponry. And uh, I found that while at uh, the naval shipyard at Hunter's Point, uh, the USS Currituck and the USS Pine Island were refitted and prepared for uh, high jump. Um, and their their bow 40 millimeter gun tubs and two forward five inch gun turrets were removed so they could put helicopter decks on them. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, interesting. I, I found yeah, I found <laughs> and I found that three of, of the four of these. Uh, Kuratuk class uh, seaplane tenders, including the USS Norton Sound, had had been modified in this way, probably because um, the use of helicopters was becoming more common. You know, they were getting the newest the newest models out. They were being tested, and and they were actually, you know, conducting flight operations on on these smaller ships. Well, on on, on all kinds of ships, you know. Well, you know, Gunner, and, uh, you, you can't find aliens with traditional weaponry anyway. <laughs> I guess not. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, they had to, they had the guns removed. I mean, it, here, there you go. There's there's two 40 millimeter aircraft mounts and four five inch gun turrets in total removed. Done. I mean, doesn't sound like they're they're fixing on fighting anybody, does it? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they loaded equipment. Uh, I think they had uh, four. Uh, LVT amphibious track vehicles. Those were like, uh, you know, what the Marines used when they were during invasions in, uh, in the Pacific. They had a number of these, uh, M29 weasels, uh, that were, that were also tracked and they had bulldozers, sleds, rollers, trucks, uh, all kinds of heavy equipment, uh, for, for transporting these supplies, uh, from the ice shelf, uh, to the base and, uh, for constructing the runway on uh, packed ice and snow. I think there was over 40, uh, you know, vehicles and all. And, of course, they tested this uh, jet-assisted takeoff stuff, right, so that they could use them on these aircraft. Uh, and um, they used them on, on getting off of the aircraft, and they also mm-hmm. used them uh, from taking off from the Little America base. And uh, I thought you'd be interested to see this, Mac. And uh, clip one is uh, showing how these aircraft took off. All right, here we go. On the carrier, six planes, triple checked, are ready for their moment of destiny. Admiral Byrd has given the pilots a final briefing. Everything depends on split-second timing. Pilots, man your plane. No 3,000-foot runway here. Only a scant 300 feet. Jet propulsion is their reliance. Crewmen attach jet containers, four to a plane. These JATO bottles are packed with flaming power. In the critical 10 seconds at takeoff, they give the kick up of two added engines. <laughs> Bird is never airborne in exactly before. 100 feet. <laughs> so- so I know the listeners can't see this, but what they've basically done is modified these these prop planes, and they're they're large planes, twin engine, and they've they've put a small pack of jet engine in the rear, and they fired the sucker off, and it is a very short runway. I mean, you've got no time at all. I I, I bet those guys had a tight one, man, coming off that plane, off that deck, <laughs> because uh, there is no room for air with that, man. And then, and even with the jet pack, they they don't really have all that much speed. Uh, getting off there, but man, that is—I uh, don't think I've ever seen anything like that, Gunner. That is—that's crazy. Yeah, the roll off, the roll off of those <laughs> aircraft is as soon as those, uh, as soon as those wheels were rolling, they fired those things off, and you're yeah. and you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, maximum takeoff weights of these aircraft at about 15 tons. Well, here, and here's another thing to consider when you start watching these guys take off. They're lined up in uh, in a linear fashion, so the man in the front, yeah. he's got. <laughs> He's got he's got a lot less time than the guy in the back. I mean, yeah. you know, that's that's he's got to be ready to go. 
And that was Bird's plane. Bird took <laughs> off first, and, and and they said that he was airborne in 100 feet. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, thought, you know, I thought we'd uh, take a look at, at some of the personnel here, because I think this gets forgotten with all this Nazis and, and UFOs and stuff like that. So I really wanted to uh, to concentrate on that just a little here. Because manning the expedition was a real issue, because the Navy was so uh, severely drawn down after the war. And um, and that also puts this claim of uh, a heavily armed invasion force in serious question. You know, uh, there, it, there was also the issue of pilots. They had little or no experience flying in Arctic conditions. And, uh, you know, aside from the mineral, the minimal uh, required crew complements for sailing, uh, a lot of these guys were handpicked for certain jobs, and um, I imagine they probably had to request volunteers too, yeah. because the Navy was so short of guys. And um, <clears throat> the expedition included uh, U.S. Navy Seabees and also uh, Underwater Demolition Team Four hmm. uh, uh, for uh, uh, clearing uh, any obstacles such as pack ice or. Uh, pressure ridges using explosives, and, the, and of course they had the CBs for constructing the runway. And uh, like I said, of course we had the mail thing right, and the publicity with that. Well, the the Tampa Bay Times interviewed uh, two local sailors prior to the expedition, and it said that Tampa Bay sailor Walter uh, Carey joined the Naval Reserve in, in July '44. And he volunteered for uh, UDT uh, training and was accepted into the program. And uh, Perry was getting ready, uh, Carey, excuse me, was was getting ready to sail with his uh, UDT team uh, to participate in the invasion of Japan when the war suddenly ended. And uh, and uh, as a result, uh, he and his uh, teammates sailed to Hawaii for more training. And they were then sent to Japan to help uh, clear waters of mines and underwater navigation hazards. Uh, he spent a year in Japan before returning to the United States where he re-enlisted re in the regular Navy, and he was uh, one of several uh, UDT experts that were hand-picked for Operation High Jump. Hmm. And uh, UDT-4 con consisted of 26 men and five officers, and their assignment was to keep the channel of the harbor ice-free. Um, and, uh, and the telephone fun. called it. Yeah, that well, sounds cold. It, it, actually, actually, is pretty dangerous work. Yeah, I mean, right. You got to imagine you've got uh, you're working with a, with an icebreaker that's out there. You know, not only do they have to get through this uh, this 600 mile uh, ice sheet, then they have to get into the harbor, and that's where they use the the UDT guys um, to to actually uh, detonate charges. <laughs> on this ice to, to help break it up. And, um, and he says that in a telephone call to his mother, <laughs> this guy explained how his team would have to explode in an estimated six square miles of ice every day to carry out their mission. Okay. And I'm going to point this out here, that, that, that normally calling your mother or your girlfriend and giving them neat details about your mission <laughs> would be a violation of operational security. <laughs> I guess they weren't too worried about it, you know. Yeah, so uh, this is off base here. I'm uh, not off base, but it, it's kind of off the uh, the thing. How early on did the UD teams, UDT teams, uh, start on at this point, Gunner? Do you know, or is that that's kind of a and one to throw out there? But I, I was I, I wasn't aware that they were, you know, at what point they are actually existed. Yeah. Well, I have, I have to verify that with uh, Senior Chief uh, Don Shipley. But I think I think he's he's said that they started in forty two forty three, huh. just yeah. after just after the invasion of Tarawa. Interesting. I didn't. I wasn't aware that that was that they were around that early. Um, I thought it was a little yeah. later, even than this, probably. But interesting. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Well, according to this, it says that when he enlisted in in uh, in uh, forty four, and yeah. he had already gone through training, but but then the war was over. So I mean, the, these uh, underwater demolition teams had been established for quite a while. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was another uh, Tampa Bay sailor named Mike O'Connor, and he was a veteran of, of seven combat engagements in the Pacific Theater. And he found himself in charge of a, a group of guys on the USS Pine Island, uh, the seaplane tenor that, that was responsible for maintaining the, the helicopter platform on, on the front, on the forward deck. 
and uh, I thought I'd show you this in, in clip two because he may have uh, th this guy uh, Carrie might have been one of the guys uh, in this short film clip uh, where the uh, UDT guys uh, tested their newly issued Arctic dry suits in the ice. Here we go. That's clip two. Jane seems to like it. <laughs> Aboard the Mount Olympus, the Navy tries out one of the most important experiments assigned the expedition. Ooh. Can men survive in freezing water? <laughs> men from Mars, members of a special underwater demolition team, wear the new cold water rubber survival suit. In contrast to these skylarking youngsters eating ice cream in the ice, men in ordinary clothing are paralyzed in six minutes and die very quickly thereafter. Yet these sailors, wearing only underwear beneath their survival suits, stay in half an hour and come up chipper and warm. Oh, that's that that those suits didn't look. There's two things to this, Gunner. I don't know if you if you did this to me intentionally or not, but the men from Mars <laughs> thing that that, <laughs> that really caught me off. But the uh, well, the suits themselves didn't look like they had much thickness to them at all. Because you could see like when they got were moving around, they were like wrinkly. So it wasn't like I wonder what that was made out of. It didn't look like regular neoprene or anything. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I don't know if if they were sincerely just uh, made out of rubber or, or what. Uh, that's you know? a good point, maybe. But, yeah. but this, you know, and but this was a, uh, you know, part of the mission was, was to test uh, this this newly created stuff like that. Hmm. You know. Well, that and, that uh, that would be a. You know, I don't care how good the suit is. You know, those guys were cold. I mean, you know, cold yeah. relative. they weren't dead, but that had to be really, no really it. cold. And their faces were exposed and they were going like under the water. I mean, yeah. you know, that's like I said, that wouldn't be a fun job to be up there cleaning the or clearing the ice in any form or fashion. And, you know, you've, you're dealing with yeah. dynamite and your hands are probably shaking. And, yep. you, know, and you can yeah, sink yeah. the whole ship. <laughs> yeah. So I got, but I have a, a couple of quotes from the diary of this, uh, uh, Walter L. Carey, that was a member of UD, UDT-4, and he, he writes that on November 27, 1946, uh, uh, the team went aboard the Mount Olympus flagship. On the 28th, uh, they were given a four-day pass over Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> on the 29th, uh, yeah. 27 husky dogs came aboard, and they had a, <laughs> they had a ship farewell dance and a beer party ashore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on February 6, 1947, they had a they had a team picture made, and uh, he said that at a press conference granted uh, on February 5th, Admiral Byrd sum, uh, summarized the accomplishments of Operation High Jump up to the, up to date, and uh, Byrd said that uh, that they had discovered uh, eight new mountain ranges that ranged from uh, anywhere from 1,500 to 15,000 feet. Wow. And uh, you always hear about this this total manpower. You know, you hear these conspiracy uh, theorists with uh, you know forty seven hundred that was reported. Then they, then they jack it up to ten thousand. You know, and all this stuff like that. So I I thought I'd look into it, and it was listed at forty seven hundred. But Bird had, had stipulated that it be manned with the minimum number required, and I so I found that pretty interesting. You know. And I figured the carrier would have to have most of the, the most guys, right? right. So yeah. I checked, uh, and it was uh, three thousand four hundred fifty at full combat strength, and that would have been including the air crews. So what I what I did was I calculated what the total personnel would have been for each vessel based on the crew complement, and I came up to a total of uh, just over eight thousand. Uh, that was full combat strength. Wow. Um, which makes sense because there would have been no need for for any fighter uh, fighter air crews or or gunners mates manning all these guns or ordnance or aviation maintenance crews. You know, right. it'd have been something something more like a skeleton crew, is my guess. You know, uh, so the forty seven hundred figure would be approximately half of what would have been needed in combat. So hmm. it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, I would say I'd say you're right there. Yeah. And in all the footage that, that I've seen, I, have had, I haven't seen anyone carrying a rifle or even wearing a pistol sidearm. And none of, and none of it. I don't, I don't know if we had a, had a weapon around that time of fire in that kind of weather. 
<laughs> that's pretty cold. <laughs> yeah, well, you got yeah, that's, that you got that right too. You know, um, so I chose this next clip because it shows a uh, an important discovery of an ice free area, um, as well as looking at some of the, the personnel again. And this is where uh, people claim in Bird's secret diary that, that he saw a tropical climate with woolly mammoths running around and, you know, <laughs> mountains and trees. And, and it was actually Bird describing uh, this flight. He didn't actually go on this flight, but he described it later. And he said that the flyboys seemed to have dropped out of the 20th century into a landscape of a thousand years ago, thousands of years ago, when the land was just starting to emerge to emerge from one of the great ice ages. And uh, Bird called this uh, discovery by far the most important so far as the public interest was concerned about the expedition. Hmm. And uh, there's another explorer, explorer along with the expedition. And his name was Dr. Paul, I, Paul A. Seipel. And uh, he developed cold weather gear for the U.S. Army that was later used in the Korean War. And he noted that reporters aboard the USS Mount Olympus, you know, the group of journalists that I had described before, that had overblown these claims of, of Bird's expedition pertaining to what was called the uh, the Bunger Oasis, this uh, this this patch of ice ice free, uh, you know, lakes they had lakes and everything. <clears throat> and he said that these eleven press representatives aboard the the Mount Olympus had fired off dispatches to the outside world describing the oasis as a Shangri-La and implying that it was uh, warmed by a mysterious source of heat hmm. that, and it might be supporting vegetation. So uh, this is interesting, uh, and this is the actual the flight, but Bird was not on it, so this is clip three. 1,500 miles west of Little America, the Currituck and her western group are off the Shackleton Ice Shelf, circling the Sunset Coast. The Western Group commander, Captain Bond, gives pilots and plane crews a last briefing on Antarctic dangers and the technique of survival if forced down. The flight about to start is the longest and most important so far for the Western Group. Before takeoff, survival gear is checked, gear to keep nine men alive for 100 days, food, drugs, sleds, sleeping bags. On the water, the great PBM makes her takeoff run. Her jet assist bottles blast. She lifts quickly into the air and circles the Kuratuk once. Jet assist bottles, their work done, are dropped and make a salvo splash. The pilot, Commander David E. Bunger, wipes his frosted windshield, a constant source of trouble in polar flying. He is over the Shackleton Ice Shelf, named for the great English explorer who kept returning to the Antarctic until death so often escaped, kept its rendezvous with him. The smooth shelf roughens. Dark rocks, called nunataks, appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bunger leans forward in amazement. His eyes have caught a sudden and unbelievable change in scenery. The universal white has turned to chocolate brown dotted with blue. A cameraman goes into action. 300 square miles of land without snow. Hmm. Land that might be in New Mexico or Arizona. Pictures alone will prove Bunger has discovered a warm oasis in the shadow of the pole. It is for such supreme moments as this that men brave the hardships of exploration. The astounding, undreamed of fact is that they are over a chain of warm water lakes whose shores, except for small patches, are free of ice and snow. Commander Bunger circles the largest lake in sight, five miles long. He comes in to make a landing. Water temperatures must be recorded samples taken. He finds the water fresh, the temperature 38 degrees Fahrenheit. On the shores are vast deposits of coal and of minerals of the utmost importance to civilization. Aside from their headline discovery, Bunger and his men have another good reason for hustling home to the Currituck. A long-awaited ceremony is in progress. The whole fleet awaits news of the all-western beard derby. <laughs> the Currituck skipper, Captain Clark, is judge. His salute of the day is... Right corner mustache! <laughs> the captain...
captain awards prizes to the winners, enlisted men and officers alike, the champions in the first Antarctic Beer Derby. To the most handsome. For the bushiest. To the officer who tried the hardest. To the neatest. To the most unique. To the red all current. Well, it's really interesting. They had a beard contest. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, they yeah. kind of, I guess, they kind of got out of uh, the uh, military uh, traditionalism there at that point in the Arctic. You got a little le- leeway because these guys have full heads of hair and beards. But I found oh, yeah. it. I, th- I found it really fascinating that they did actually find a warm. I mean, relatively speaking, warm. If it's thirty-eight degree water, that's not all that warm to me. But. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> it's it was you know when they flew over and crested there, it did change. And I was, I'm curious how far inland that was, or you know, was that near the coast, or was that you know somewhere like in the middle? I, I didn't really get the perspective there of where they were actually at, okay. but that that's kind of crazy. Yeah, if if you look if you look at the the map uh, that that I have on there, yeah, these guys were in in the in the I think it says Eastern Group, but if you're if you're looking at it as, as you normally would on a map, and you look on the left. The left-hand side portion of the map, yeah, which w- which would be which would be west. Um, this aircraft w- was flying inland. I, I don't know, probably one or two hundred miles is when they discovered this. Wow, that's that's a you know that's a really strange phenomenon. Yeah. But um, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I don't think there's any surprise that you would find something like that. But uh, but considering though the the ruggedness of those mountains <laughs> down there and 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 the this is the general area, and you know it's a very very turbulent down there from what i understand now, it's hard to believe that there's a place that's you know that's at least semi warm <laughs> yeah and and there are several that have been discovered just like that you hmm. know and, and this is what and this is what uh you know there's there's one up north or where the supposed uh, nazi secret base was yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh, even that even has uh there, there's been uh two uh two stations up there science stations uh since uh, 2018 so before we move on, Gunner, I, I, this Sipple, Sipple guy, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I, I noticed I was uh, looking at where um, Bird's papers reside, I think at Ohio State University is where all that's at. And I, I looked at the index of that a couple weeks ago when we started into this, and I noticed that he, he had some part of his papers was this guy's criticism of him. There was like three or four notations in there of, of a critical – now, I don't, you can't click on them and actually look at them. They just You can just kind of see the archive. But it's uh, interesting that you have his name in here. I kind of recognize that. Yeah, yeah. That would that would be Doctor Paul A. Seipel, yeah. as pronounced. And uh, yeah, I'll I'll uh, mention him in in just a little bit oh, okay. here because it's, it's very it's very important that 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 uh, that he was on this on this expedition, and this is all part of the science science and technology portion that that, that there were scientists in uh, oceanography, meteorology, geology. Uh, radar magnetology. There's a team from the United States uh, Navy Electronics Lab. Uh, there was a team from Engineering and Technical Services, uh, the Office of the Chief Signal Officer from the Pentagon. Uh, I have all those, uh, all those PDF files are listed in my sources. For, they all have reports that they submitted. Um, some others included uh, Dr. H. Howe, who was the uh, from the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Geodetic Service? Uh, Dr. H. Richardson, who was the Assistant Staff Medical Officer. Uh, Jack E. Perkins, Expedition Biologist and Representative for the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Dr. Paul A. Seipel, who was the Senior Representative of the War Department. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but and Seipel had been on previous expeditions with Bird in '29. And in the 1930s, and uh, the first one, he was only age 19 uh, after becoming an Eagle Scout. And Seipel was handpicked by Bird. He was he was uh, later become a, a geologist and Arctic explorer himself. And I, I've included a short bio of uh, Seipel uh, that's a YouTube video. I put that in my sources for people to see if they're interested. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they did. Uh, uh, water temperature, you know, Bathy thermograph, uh, water temperature records were processed by the Scripps uh, Institute of uh, Oceanography. They tested the salinity of the water, and those were analyzed. Those samples were analyzed uh, by the by the same group, and uh, they they also did some kind of bacteriological 
uh, analysis of the seafloor sediments and information on uh, Antarctic uh, phytoplankton. Uh, phytoplankton, plankton's a big uh, a big thing. These uh, uh, the seals and, and penguins and whales they all eat that stuff. Yeah, right. And and uh, the geological observations included data uh, concerning the Antarctic seafloor sediments and, and the and the features of the seafloors, and of course the ice free areas that that they discovered. And um, biological observations included data. Uh, concerning marine growth, natural slicks, uh, and deep scattering layers in the Pacific and the Antarctic. And, uh, there were, they collected specimens too. There were specimens collected for the, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And while they were getting through the pack ice, uh, U.S. Marines bravely captured, uh, six leopard seals <laughs> and one Ross seal, which is pretty rare. And, and they, uh, they hoisted them onto ships using cargo nets. And there's also a number of emperor penguins that willingly agreed to be brought back. <laughs> <laughs> so they they, and, uh, they brought the seals back? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh. Yes, they did. I, and I saw yeah. that one video uh, earlier. I was looking at your some of your clips and the, the, the lead-in. We didn't get to that, but they were talking about they fed the dogs the seals. That was the only thing, time they killed the seals was yes. to feed the dogs. Huh. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. They actually hunted seals, and, 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 they used, and, and they used the seal meat to feed the dogs. And I wondered about this this deal with these animals that brought them back on these ships, but but there were the the two supply ships actually had well decks, uh-huh. you know, so they could lower the ballast in these decks. And I don't know if they actually used if kept those animals on there to to let them go go into the seawater and all yeah. without escaping. <laughs> huh. But it's possible it's possible that they actually had had them. I mean. They could have used them, is, is what I'm saying. I don't know that they did for sure, but that's interesting. I, you know, you never would think about that, but you know, it's another, another, another mark in the animals of, well, not war, but animals in the military. <laughs> yeah, um, and there were there were separate, like I said, there were separate reports created by all these groups that I put in my sources, and and uh, they were also using the latest uh, Trimeticon and and K17 cameras. Uh, that were used in World War II uh, for reconnaissance, right? And they were using these now for uh, photo mapping. And in this next clip, it shows how they used these. And, and this is all also the the flight that uh, Bird is said to have visited the Hollow Earth, you know, uh, in the South Pole and at the North Pole too, you know. <laughs> but but no, this is the flight that that people try to say uh, that he was uh, visited the Hollow Earth. Um, because uh, Bird flew the farthest and encountered these mountains at ten to fifteen thousand feet, and he had to jettison almost all of the gear except for the cameras and the film. Mm. You know, and this is why he was two or three hours late coming back. Um, but this next clip illustrates the primary mission of, of photo mapping in Clip Four. The nine sunless months of a dark, treacherous Antarctic winter. Marooned, Admiral Bird and his staff plan the big flight to the South Pole and far beyond. This is the culmination, the last mass flight. Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up. All controls triple checked. Motors heated. For they face cold as extreme as 60 below. Unrelenting, murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulse is spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice, detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, and precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane, gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. (laughs) Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, 
Now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration. Just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea as well as on it. So interesting there, Gunner. Just an observation. In the uh, the previous video, yeah. when they were taking off from the water, they used to <laughs> still use the jetpack, and they didn't use it on the land. I just wonder what the yeah. why they why in the water why they still incorporated that into the uh, the thing because I would think you'd have plenty of water to run into. You know, it was not like well, their lack of distance. The reason the reason for that was that these aircraft were extremely heavy. Their takeoff weight. I mean, they were loaded down with extra fuel tanks. Gotcha. The most of the, uh, that was it. I mean. Yeah. They had to get these aircraft airborne as soon as possible because because they had to get to a maximum uh, effective range to conduct these uh, photo mapping missions, and uh, it, it was imperative that, that they had to conserve as much fuel mm. as possible. You know, and so they were carrying not only were they carrying uh, uh, external uh, or extra internal fuel tanks, they were carrying all this survival gear. You know, for a hundred days in, in, in case they went down. So they were like. <laughs> fully loaded, right. and so that's why they that's why they use the jet assist to to get off the water and the land. Interesting, yeah. that's interesting. I, I never had saw anything like that. <laughs> yeah. So you know, as far as the conditions went, you know, unlike the uh, previous uh, like 1934 expedition where where these teams actually spent the winter, these were milder conditions, uh, and sometimes the temperatures on the ground um, didn't even go below zero. Uh, you know, one one night they had a a storm overnight, and uh, with with winds like 100 miles per hour, and it didn't damage uh, any of the aircraft or the structures. The, the structure it was like a tent city. They had some wooden buildings, but it was more or less a tent city. Mm. And of course, they had the the Antarctic uh, period of 24 hours of daylight um, allowed for you know photo mapping nonstop, and they did this for three weeks. Oh wow! And uh, and they they had problems and delays and the big thing was the pack ice. And this pack ice was 600 miles wide and uh, 20 feet high, you know, at sea level over the sea level, and it brought all these ships almost to a halt. They had anticipated getting through it in less than a week, but uh, after the first week, they'd only made like 100 miles, and uh, wow. they suffered uh, ship damage. They they lost a helicopter due to icing on the rotor blades. And uh, one of those PBM uh, Mariner aircraft was torn from its torn from its deck in heavy seas. Uh, they had the submarine, of course, the USS Senate, but it, it became repeatedly trapped in the ice and and had to be rescued by an icebreaker several times. So they just gave up on it, and they towed it to Scott Island, um, where it served as a weather station for the rest of the operation. Mm. And then they had to get through these pressure ridges on the ice shelf. And these, these things, uh, some of them were like 50 feet high and 100 feet thick. And so these UDT teams had to, had to blast through them. And that took an additional three or four days to do before they could deliver like 500,000 tons of equipment and supplies to the base. What exactly is a pressure, pressure ridge, Gunner? I, I don't know what that is. A pressure ridge is if you've got, uh, ice, over water, right? This uh-huh. is what this was. This was a the Ross ice shelf. Yeah. And what happens is is when this uh, the constriction of the ice, movement of the water, um, as as the ice expands and contracts, it it shoves in on itself, mm. and it creates these these huge ridges or, or these hills in itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so they call so they so yeah so they call them pressure ridges, and they had to blast through them uh, huh. to be able. To be able to get through, right? Okay. And uh, there, every ship in the central group uh, sustained hull damage from the ice. Uh, two or three had to even stop leaks, you know. And others had to damage. Uh, uh, they had damage to propellers and rudders uh, that had to be replaced on the, on the return home. And um, after the operation, it was determined uh, that uh, coastal ground points uh, hadn't been established for this photo map- mapping. Due to the ice delays, and uh, but these were the early days of that type of mapping, you know, using these reconnaissance cameras, 
And so what they did was they, they created a follow-up uh, operation called Operation Windmill uh, in, in the next year, 1948. And they went down there and established uh, at least 30 ground control points uh, so, so that they could uh, uh, have the, make sense of any of these 70,000 photographs that these guys took, you know. Right, yeah. And, uh, and of course, today uh, they, they still need these uh, ground control points, even for satellites. Huh. And, of course, I've, I've, gone, I've gone a little long here. I don't want to explain that kind of process of, of, of the mapping process, but you, you get what I mean, right? Yeah, those right. are very important yeah. to have those. Um, as far as the accidents and deaths, uh, there were. And it's generally reported that there were four deaths during the operation. But I found three more, uh, according to the official Navy report. According to that, there were seven deaths. Uh, there were three members of, of a PBM Mariner that crashed on Wright's Peninsula uh, that were killed. And one of those survivors had both his legs amputated b- below the knee mm. as a result of his injuries and, and subsequent frostbite. Um, uh, the six uh, men that survived had to survive for two weeks in bad weather before finally being rescued. Uh, and they were dropped uh, uh, supplies, and they hiked. They had to hike ten miles <laughs> before finally being rescued. Oh gosh! <laughs> uh, yeah, um, there one man from the USS Na- Yancey which is a supply ship, uh, was killed in an unloading accident at the Bay of Wales. And this young seaman was only uh, age 17 and, and had just joined the Navy. Wow. Uh, there, were t- there were two men from the Western group that were killed in an automobile accident uh, while on Liberty in, in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> and one man from the Mount Olympus drowned in Panama. And uh, they said that the guy was uh, on Liberty, and he must have missed the motor launch back to the ship. <laughs> and he was he was actually a wall, you oh, know gosh. what I mean. <laughs> and and so and the guy attempted to avoid detection by swimming back from to the ship, and he drowned. Oh God, <laughs> that uh, sounds like my luck. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Glad I never had to go through that. <laughs> um, so, but there have been efforts to recover those those uh, the three bodies of those crewmen. Even uh, as, as late as 2009, huh. uh, the the name of the aircraft was uh, George One, and uh, there was an effort started by two of his nephews uh, in 2009. A guy named uh, Lou Sapienza from the Greenland Expedition Society. Uh, he was the guy that recovered the P-38 Glacier Girl uh, in Greenland from under 250 feet of ice in 1992. And he volunteered to help these guys out because they believe that the remains are now under like 150 feet of ice. Wow. And uh, <laughs> the, the Navy considered the mission to be too dangerous, and it, and it was a difficult decision because it would set a precedent for the recovery of sailors' remains around the world, and the Navy has not yet agreed to be involved. I just, I just hmm. don't understand that. Interesting. I really yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's kind of it, interesting too that 150 feet of ice. I mean that you know we hear about global warming and retraction of the ice shelf. But that sounds to <laughs> me like it's grown quite a bit. <laughs> oh yeah, every every year, every every year. I mean every year there's 20 to 30 feet of of ice and snow accumulates uh, at least every every year. Wow, down there. Um, so for the outcome of it, you know the Navy logged like 220 flight flight hours. They took. 70,000 photographs of 500,000 square miles of land area and coastline. Um, and according to the official report, all the objectives uh, were accomplished, with the exception of uh, building this uh, Marston Matt uh, steel runway uh, so that they could take wheeled aircraft, land wheeled aircraft down there. Um, but, you know, of course, due to the delay in reaching the base and because of the severe ice conditions, um, they had to evacuate early. You know, they were late getting on there anyway, trying to get through the ice, and uh, they had to get out of there or else they were going to be stuck in there for the winter. And so they did establish this little America 4 base, and uh, the expedition discovered that, uh, of course, it had areas that were ice-free and in pockets of water. And from a scientific perspective, the expedition was a complete success. And Air and Space uh, Magazine indicated that Operation High Jump laid the foundation for further uh, U.S. explorations of the continent 
through the beginning of the photo mapping uh, process, um, the six uh, R4D aircraft uh, were left behind. And I don't know if all of them were ever recovered or used again. Uh, when they went back there uh, <laughs> the next year, they found them buried in the snow. <laughs> so oh, wow. I don't know if they ever got any of them out of there or they just left them. I mean, it, it perfectly preserves everything. Right. But it just, it just, uh, it seems like a waste, uh, you know, to leave all that stuff behind to have it buried. But, yeah. you know, what do I know? That's the military. You know? yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way they yeah. operate. Right. And Bird was interviewed, uh, in December 1954, uh, just prior to another operation called Deep Freeze. And, uh, he referenced what, uh, High Jump had discovered and, and he also mentions, uh, strategic importance of it. And that no woman had ever set forth, uh, had set foot on Antarctica yet in 1954. Mm. And that's clip five. A, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development of air power increased their the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula? Was uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control <laughs> the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica, and between it. there and Cape Horn. I've heard it said that uh, there are seven continents in the world, and one of them has never been seen by a woman, and that's Antarctica. Is that actually true? Well, if the power Peninsula is an island, as far as I know, that's true. No woman's ever stepped foot upon the Antarctic continent, and it's the most peaceful place in the world. <laughs> well, I'm sure that won't last very long. <laughs> uh, <wow>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now, shame on Bird, right? Shame on Bird. <laughs> There's probably you know? a lot of truth to that. <laughs> but you know but you know what? Bird was wrong. <laughs> and, and, and I believe he knew he was wrong when he made the statement, and he made it on purpose. He was being an asshole, like he said. <laughs> and, and I'm re- yeah, and, but I'm researching that, that story for another segment. Okay. Because I could prove it, and, and I know who, who the woman was, the, the first American woman to set for set foot in Antarctica. Well, I won't give it too much more away, just to say that uh, it did involve Admiral Byrd, and was, it was the last privately funded uh, Antarctic expedition. I thought you'd enjoy that one, Beast. <laughs> That's a good one. But, so I'm running a little late, Mac, so I, I'm wow. not going to go into this Treaty of uh, Antarctica, um, because that, that came about later, you know, and it basically it was... It was to set aside Antarctica for a scientific, as a scientific preserve, basically, and established freedom of uh, scientific investigation, and it banned uh, military activity on the continent. Uh, so this was kind of like the first uh, arms regulation treaty that they wanted to, that the that the the countries of the world wanted to set it aside and not do anything. And it wasn't that the <laughs> It wasn't that the, uh, the, the hollow earth, uh, people living there wanted to be left alone <laughs> or that the Nazis wanted to continue hiding there and it's, it was all covered up. You know, it, it's just a, I mean, there's been, uh, at least 55 Antarctic stations, uh, established as a result of it. So it, um, is it true though? And is this the same treaty that we hear about that, that disallows just like a private individual from flying down there? Not that you would want to or have the, have the capability. But if you if you did like I, I, the, the rumor has it, then the and the word on the street in the conspiracy world is that you know you can't fly over, you know you can't even take a ship and approach the the locations that it's very guarded in that regard. Is this is this the same treaty that that makes that, or is that just a myth? Um, I think that I think that most of that's a myth. I've been looking in, into that um, as far as aircraft flying over the poles. There's an issue with uh, with magnetism and other stuff like that right, and yeah. just and just just to the fact that people don't realize how big this area is i mean this is an area bigger than uh the continent of europe or, or europe <laughs> i shouldn't say continent but <laughs> europe and the united states combined i mean this is a, a massive area and i think it's more or less a safety issue that the, they're just warning people hey you know you just can't go down there right without expecting to have problems you know um 
anyway, you, you know, I, I encourage anyone who's interested in all this to review the sources that I cite for this uh, on these segments on my blog and, and, and look at the official documents for themselves and, and look at the other things that I've amassed in this in this, in this series here. You know, and contrary to what you might hear, that you know, this 1948 Navy documentary that we've been seeing clips from is called The Secret Land Operation High Jump. And I don't think it's uh, Navy propaganda or anything like that. I just think that that was the style they did it in. Mm. And like I said, with all the publicity and everything, everybody wanted to see it. Right. You know, yeah. So that's, that's what eventually came out of it. And I'd also recommend uh, people read the National Geographic article uh, written by Bird, and I've included that uh, in, uh, as a PDF in, in my sources. And, and I thought what we'd do in the final segment is just take some time to review and, and discuss this. And yeah. uh, and if anybody has any questions or comments, you know, I, I can address them. I've had quite a few so far, you know, so I'll do my best to answer any questions that anybody might have. Yeah, no, Gunner. This has uh, been an interesting one. I think the big takeaway from this is that there was a big push for this to be public. There was a lot of there was a lot of articles. There were a lot of you know just regular folks that were looking forward to this from the adventure standpoint. And there was a military training component to this, and and uh, there was some interesting things discovered. The warm water thing, and the, they didn't really go into the detail on what kind of minerals that were down there. Uh, but I would be curious to see some of the details on that too. But, you know, yeah. I, I think that we've, you know, you've established that the secrecy to this thing isn't as, as a lot of people portray it to be. And it was much more out in the open than, than we sometimes just casually consider. Right. Right. And, and, and those reports, you know, of course, they're, I've listed it. There's a, an oceanography report and a radar report. Uh, but I haven't seen a, a geology report. Um, so. I'd have to go dig for that. But. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not trying to give you more. Work. I was just. Uh, I was yeah. just thinking. You know, I, the, the guy in the video mentioned that that, and I've always thought that was probably the the main reason to explore that area, other than just that yeah. do it. But uh, well, like you know, I said, I mean, Bird said that they found coal enough to supply the entire world for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. And of course, they speculated that there was uranium, and they, of course, one of the rumors before they even went was that. Uh, if there's uranium down there, they're going down there to get the uranium, right? Exactly. So they can build yeah. bombs, and of course they they denied all that too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but uh, yeah, but right. I I think they're just trying to set Antarctica aside as it is. Yeah. Um, it's it's a fascinating story. It, it really is to think about the 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 vastness of that place and and how yeah. how, how secluded it is, you know, and then. I, it, it's just really interesting, and uh, certainly appreciate your uh, work here. And we definitely look forward to part four next week. And uh, Gunner, uh, have a good weekend and um, have a good night. Thank you. You too, Mac. Good night. All right, there goes there goes Gunner. We are uh, broadcasting worldwide here via the Hillbilly Radio Network. Are you back with us there, Beast? Are you on the air or are you not? I, on the yes. Air? There you go, man. Um, interesting stuff. I've been there, here like the Gunner. whole time. Uh, we. Um, you got in, you know, that, that's, that's a, it's interesting, the, some of the details involved in that. I always enjoy these studies of, uh, history. I still, you know, I still want to believe on a, on a certain level that there was some other, another reason. I, I never was like the UFO, the battle stuff, but I think that the Nazi stuff, you know, I don't know. Uh, I no think... Nazis, no aliens, <laughs> no women. <laughs> no women. Uh, yeah. So there you go, man. Uh, in, interesting. So let's take a break right here. We'll be back in your moments for the after show to begin. A six four six one zero thirty one thirty one. 